the mark of the beast, the most urgent warning in all of human history, and it is given by God Himself. If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Many Christians are confused on what this mysterious mark is. This knowledge is essential because whoever receives the mark will be eternally destroyed. This video may be the most important you will ever watch. We will go straight to the Bible to reveal with 100% certainty the mark of the beast and how you can avoid it. Hi, this is Dustin with Hope Through Prophecy. On this channel, we help you to better understand Bible prophecy and be prepared for the soon return of Jesus. If you're new, please subscribe and make sure all bell notifications are turned on. To receive a link to a church near you that teaches the same truths that we share on this channel, just text CHURCH to 50597. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortal minds will be revealed in this video. Please pray before watching. Before we reveal the mark of the beast, we will first review the identity of the beast itself and also God's mark or seal for His people in the last days, of which the mark of the beast is a direct counterfeit. First, let us travel back to the courts of heaven, where this conflict between good and evil began. Lucifer was created perfect and was recognized as the wisest and most beautiful of all the created beings. In fact, he held the exalted position of being the covering cherub of God's throne in heaven. Within this throne is contained God's holy Ten Commandment Law, the unchangeable transcript of his character, the eternal code of moral living for all the universe. Lucifer, like all of God's created beings, was given free will. Instead of using this free will to glorify and honor God, Lucifer chose to rebel and allowed his heart to be filled with pride. He coveted the very throne of God. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. Lucifer became the first to commit iniquity or sin, which the Bible defines as breaking God's law. He broke the very Ten Commandment law that he had been assigned to cover and exalt in heaven. Refusing to return his allegiance to God, Lucifer was eventually cast out of heaven, along with those who rebelled with him, one-third of the angels in heaven. Why didn't God destroy Lucifer right then and there? If he did, then the universe would obey God out of fear rather than love. There would still be doubts about God's character and His law. God is allowing sin to run its course so that each human being can see the results of sin and decide for themselves which master they will serve. Now the war between good and evil rages on, and this planet is the battleground. Lucifer, now known as Satan, roams this earth, seeking to tempt human beings, the crown of God's creation, into rebelling against their Creator and His holy law. The Bible warns us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan, in the form of a serpent, tempted Adam and Eve, our first parents, into sin, bringing death, pain, and woe to this world. Jesus Christ, the hero of the human race, came to this earth to pay the death penalty for our sin, for the broken law of God. Jesus lived a perfect life and kept His Father's commandments. Yet, He died for us, that we might live. His sacrificial death on the cross proved two things about God. One, that God is righteous. His Ten Commandment law is eternal and can never be changed. Even Jesus had to pay the penalty for the broken law of God, since He took our sins upon Himself. Two, it proved that God is love. He sent His own Son to die that we might live. Throughout history, Satan has worked through various nations and agencies to try to tempt, deceive, and destroy God's people, including ancient Egypt and the teaching of spiritualism that the soul lives on after death, and Babylon with its heathen practices and sorcery. 
and the brutal Roman Empire who tried to destroy Jesus as a child. And as we saw in a previous video, Satan would even infiltrate the church itself using the Roman Catholic Church-State Union to persecute and deceive God's people. But during every period of history, God has always had a people that stand for Him even in the midst of the most ferocious attacks. This great controversy between Christ and Satan has raged on through the centuries and continues to this very day. Whether we realize it or not, each of us is engaged in a war, a battle for our very soul. We must make a decision, a choice, as to which master we will serve, Christ or Satan. Throughout history, allegiance to God has always been evidenced by one thing, obedience. Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Our actions, our decisions, reveal to God and to the universe who we belong to. So the mark of the beast, the final test for mankind, will be an issue of worship, an issue of obedience. Who will we serve? Before we reveal this infamous mark, we must identify the beast itself, also known as the Antichrist. There is only one power in human history that perfectly matches each biblical description of the beast, the Roman Catholic Church-State Union, the papacy. This is not an attack on the people within the Catholic Church, but rather a warning against a false system of worship. This is also not a new teaching, but was widely accepted as clear truth by the Protestant world. Numerous Christian reformers and preachers, such as Luther, Calvin, Wesley, Williams, Spurgeon, and more, have all firmly held this view. Let us quickly review. The Antichrist Beast 1. Rises out of the sea. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. The Bible tells us that a sea represents a heavily populated area. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The papacy fulfills this point as it arose in Western Europe, the center of world civilization at that time. 2. The Antichrist receives its throne, power, and authority from the dragon. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon represents Satan, and in this context, pagan Rome, who Satan worked through in an attempt to destroy Jesus at his birth. History reveals that pagan Rome did in fact transfer its power, throne, and authority directly to papal Rome, the Catholic Church state. The Roman Church pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. The Pope who calls himself King and Pontifex Maximus, is Caesar's successor. The Catholic Church no doubt matches this second characteristic. 3. The Antichrist becomes a global power. All the world marveled and followed the beast. An authority was given him over tribe, tongue, and nation. No one will argue the global power and influence of the Catholic Church. Leaders of the most powerful nations in the world flock to pay homage to the Pope. In fact, the very word Catholic means universal. There's no doubt that Proof 3 matches the Catholic Church, and it makes sense because this beast power must have worldwide influence in order to enforce the mark of the beast, which will be revealed later in this video. 4. The Antichrist is guilty of blasphemy on his head a blasphemous name, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. The Bible defines blasphemy in two ways, one claiming the power to forgive sins, and two claiming to be equal with God. The Catholic Catechism itself states, does the priest truly forgive the sins? Or does he only declare that they are remitted? The priest does 
really and truly forgive the sins and virtue of the power given to him by Christ. The entire Catholic confessional system is a man-made counterfeit to God's plan of salvation. Only God can forgive sins. Not only does the papacy claim to forgive sins, but they believe the Pope to be equal to God himself. Pope Leo XIII states, We, the Popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Friends, we must be clear. The papacy is guilty of blasphemy. We will soon see how the papacy's blasphemous claims are directly related to the mark of the beast. 5. The Antichrist rules for 42 prophetic months. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We see this principle in Numbers 14.34 and also Ezekiel 4.6, which states, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So this Antichrist power would rule for 42 prophetic months, which is 1260 days in the Hebrew calendar, which amounts to 1260 literal years. Would the papacy fulfill this specific prophecy? Papal Rome received full supremacy in Europe in 538 AD, when there was no longer opposition to Emperor Justinian's decree giving the Pope complete control in Europe. The papacy enjoyed this absolute power over the nations of Europe throughout the Dark Ages, when the people were kept in spiritual and intellectual darkness. Then, in the year 1798, the papacy received what came to be known as a deadly wound when the Pope was taken captive by the French General Berthier. This event marked the end of the papacy's dominance in Europe. We can see that exactly 1260 years passed between 538 AD and 1798 AD, a perfect fulfillment of prophecy and yet another specific proof that the papacy is the Antichrist. 6. The Antichrist receives a deadly wound that is later healed. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Again, this deadly wound took place in 1798 when Napoleon's general Berthier took the Pope captive, effectively crippling the papacy and ending their 1260 year reign. However, the Bible prophesied that this deadly wound would be healed. No one will argue the universal power influence and prestige the papacy now has. Shockingly, even much of the Protestant world is seeking to unite with Rome. They have abandoned the position of the reformers who denounced the papacy as the Antichrist and forgotten that the word Protestant involves a protest against the false teachings and practices of the Catholic Church. The Christian world is being groomed and prepared to receive the mark of the beast, which will soon be revealed in this video. Proof 7. The Antichrist receives worship. They worship the beast, saying who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? A beast in Bible prophecy represents a nation. However, this beast of Revelation 13 would be unique from others and that it would be both a nation and a religious power that receives worship. We all know that the papacy is a religious power, but did you know that Vatican City, the headquarters of the papacy, is actually a nation? In fact, the Vatican is the world's smallest country, taking up just 0.2 square miles inside of Rome, Italy. That's just 20% of the size of Central Park in New York City. Despite its minuscule size, the Vatican is one of the most powerful nations in the world and receives worship from across the globe with over 1 billion followers. It's no surprise that the papacy matches this proof as well because the mark of the beast, as mentioned before, involves worship. 8. The Antichrist persecutes God's people. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The Bible prophesied that this Antichrist power would shed the blood of God's people, the saints. The fact that the papacy matches this proof better than any organization in history simply cannot be denied. 
that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Historians estimate that over 50 million lives were destroyed by the papacy during the Dark Ages over matters of religion. To his credit, Pope John Paul II admitted to and apologized for these mass murders, but this cannot undo these horrible atrocities. 9. The Antichrist has a man as its leader. Daniel chapter 7 describes the little horn power which also refers to the Antichrist. In this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. The Roman Catholic Church state fulfills proof 9 as well. The Church has a clear and visible leader, the Pope, whose teachings echo the blasphemous claims of this worldwide power. 10. The Antichrist has the number 666. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Notice that 666 is not the mark of the beast, but rather it is the number of a man. This mysterious number would identify the leader of the Antichrist power. One of the names often given to the Pope is Vicarius Philae Die, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God or substitute for the Son of God. We have already seen that this is a position that the papacy claims. Notice what happens when you add up the Roman numeral values for his name. These numbers add up exactly to, you guessed it, 666, the number of the beast and the number of a man, just as the Bible prophesied. Only the papacy, led by the Pope as their visible leader, fulfills all of these biblical descriptions of the Antichrist beast with perfect detail. However, there is another characteristic of the Antichrist that we must discuss as we prepare to reveal the mark of the beast. In Daniel's description of the Antichrist, we read that it would think to change times and laws. Is it true that the papacy, the beast of Revelation 13, would attempt to change God's times and laws? Yes, it is. In their official catechisms, the Catholic Church has changed the Ten Commandments. They have removed the Second Commandment, which forbids the worship of idols, and they have split the Tenth Commandment into two, so that there are still ten in total. But what about the time mentioned in Daniel 7.25? Did the papacy attempt to change God's times in any way? Yes, they did. Once again, in their official catechisms, the Catholic Church has shortened the fourth commandment that discusses the Sabbath, the only commandment that deals with time, from 94 words to just eight. What's more, they have openly and blasphemously defied God and His law by claiming to change the Sabbath day from the seventh day, as the Bible commands, to the first day of the week also known as Sunday. Please do not take my word for this, friend. In their official writings, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, the papacy states, Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Church even boldly claims to have the power to change God's holy law. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. For more information on the change of the Sabbath, please watch this video by clicking the link above. Does any man or organization truly have the power to change God's law? Absolutely not. The Bible says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. A false teaching has crept into the Christian church that says obedience to God's commandments is no longer required. 
Friends, this is a deadly deception that is not supported by the Bible. On the contrary, God tells us, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. For more information on the permanence of God's Ten Commandment law, please click on the link above. And we have already seen that obedience to God's laws is the sign that we belong to Him. So it makes sense that the Antichrist beast would try to change God's law to deceive people into disobedience and separation from God. In fact, the seal of God has to do with allegiance and obedience to God's law. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Before we reveal the mark of the beast, we will now identify the seal of God which the mark of the beast is a direct counterfeit. If you ask any banker, the best way to discover a counterfeit is to first learn the truth. In ancient times, when a ruler sent out a decree, his authorized seal contained three elements, name, title, and territory. Official seals contain each of these three things. So what about the seal of God? We have learned that it has to do with obedience to God's commandments. Do any of the commandments have all three elements of an official seal? Yes, there is one. Consider the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. This is God's name. In it thou shalt not do any work, for in six days the Lord made, this reveals God's title, the Creator, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, this is God's territory, and rested the seventh day. So, we can see that the Sabbath is the only one of God's commandments that contains all three elements of an official seal, God's name, title, and territory. Speaking of God's Sabbath, the Bible reveals, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them, and Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Bible reveals that the word seal, mark, token, and sign can be used interchangeably. In the last days, the devil will have his mark, but the Sabbath is God's sign, or mark, of his faithful people who will be protected and receive eternal life. For more information on the Sabbath and why so many Christians worship on Sunday, please click on the link above. So let's review what we have learned. 1. The mark of the beast will come from the beast power, which we have identified as the papacy. 2. The mark of the beast will be centered around worship, specifically obedience to God's commandments. Another reason we can be sure of this is because the verse directly after the Mark of the Beast warning in Revelation 14 declares, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yes, in contrast to those who worship the beast and take his mark, are those that stay faithful to Jesus and obey his commandments. Three. The mark of the beast will be a substitute or counterfeit of the seal of God, which we have learned is the Sabbath. It is now time, friends, the moment we have been waiting for. What is the mark of the beast? Let us allow the beast power itself, the papacy, to answer this question for us. The church is above the Bible. In this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Speaking of this change of the Sabbath, the papacy even openly admits this act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Sunday sacredness is the mark of the beast. The alleged change of the Sabbath is the sign or mark of the beast's supposed power and authority. Now let's be clear, many sincere loving Christians worship on Sunday or believe it to be a holy day. We are not judging anyone's heart. God only holds us responsible for what we know or had the chance to know. But when God reveals truth to us, we are responsible to follow it 
and it will be for our blessing. It's also important to note that no one has the mark of the beast right now. We will learn when this will take place in just a moment. Friends, only one day in the week is sacred, and that is the seventh day Sabbath, which goes from sunset Friday to sunset on Saturday. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Notice that God blessed the seventh day, not a seventh day, and he specifically blessed the day in which he ended his creation of this world. Only God can make a day holy, and we have no right to choose another day. By substituting Sunday for Saturday, the papacy has created a direct counterfeit to the Sabbath, the seal of God. As prophesied in the Bible, they have sought to change times and law, and in so doing, claim to be above the Bible and even above God himself. But what does God say about teaching man-made beliefs instead of the Bible? And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. So how does one receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God? Speaking of the beast of Revelation 13, the papacy, the Bible says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. We know that the book of Revelation is full of symbols. So what does this mean to receive a mark in the forehead? This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Notice that God promises to write his laws on our minds, and it is the frontal lobe, or the forehead, where we make our moral decisions. The Bible reveals that the forehead is symbolic of our decisions. Speaking of God's seal, the Sabbath, the fourth commandment declares, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And where do we remember? With our mind or forehead. Accepting the seal of God involves making a decision to obey God's true Sabbath, worshiping Him as the Creator. In contrast, the mark of the beast can be received on either the forehead or the hand. What does this mean? Again, the forehead is where we make our moral decisions. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. The mark will be received on the forehead when someone believes in a false Sabbath, Sunday, despite the biblical evidence that shows otherwise. They are deceived. What about the hand? The Bible reveals that the hand is a symbol of work or actions. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. The mark of the beast will be received on the hand by those who decide to follow the crowd and accept Sunday as holy in order to avoid persecution. This group is not deceived into believing a false Sabbath, but their actions will show submission to the authority of the beast. So, we can be certain that the mark of the beast is not a physical mark. Remember, the plan of salvation and the entire great controversy between good and evil has always been based on our free will, our decision to either accept or reject God and His requirements. And the greatest showdown between good and evil will be based on the same principle, the freedom of choice. To suggest otherwise is simply not biblical or even reasonable. Think about it. If the mark of the beast was a physical sign, such as a barcode, tattoo, or other such thing, then sincere Christians who have made the decision to follow God and even die for their faith could be drugged and given the mark of the beast while they are unconscious without even choosing to comply with it. Throughout the book of Revelation, the key issue in the battle between good and evil is worship and making a decision to either follow Christ or Satan. The mark of the beast will be based on our decision. When will people receive the mark of the beast? And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
This verse reveals that there will be an economic boycott on those who refuse the mark. So the mark will not be just a religious issue, but a political one as well. The government will require Sunday to be accepted as a holy day. Since the mark of the beast will not be a physical mark, how will the government be able to identify those who cannot buy or sell in the last days? The Bible doesn't reveal exactly how these laws will be enforced, but it could be that the bank accounts of those who refuse the mark will be frozen, or it is possible that a microchip or some other device might be used to identify those who can buy and sell in the last days, but this device will not be the mark of the beast. We have already seen from the Bible that the mark is a symbol for our decisions or actions. The mark will be received when the civil authorities enforce acceptance of Sunday as a holy day. When people comply with these decrees, rather than the commandment of God to keep the Sabbath holy, they will then receive the mark of the beast. But could such a Sunday law really happen? The fact is, it already has. Currently on the official books of 28 U.S. states are what are known as blue laws. According to worldpopulationreview.com, blue laws are laws designed to restrict certain activities on Sundays or other specific days for religious reasons in order to observe a day of worship or rest. Blue laws also may ban shopping or ban sale of specific items on Sundays. In the 18th and 19th centuries, people were often arrested, fined, and sometimes even served jail time for conducting business on Sunday. It was believed that these citizens were actually breaking the Sabbath. As our culture has grown more secular over the years, many of these Sunday blue laws have been repealed, yet they still exist in various states. Sometimes it is the sale of alcohol that is prohibited on Sunday. These blue laws are often defended because they are seen to have both a secular and a religious benefit. So what is the problem with these Sunday laws? First of all, the Bible teaches that the seventh day of the week is holy, the Sabbath, and not the first day of the week, Sunday. Secondly, these Sunday laws are a dangerous combination of church and state. Throughout history, when religious matters have been legislated by the government, it has often led to mass bloodshed of God's people. God's government is based on freedom of choice and not force or pressure. That is why the United States of America was founded on the principles of civil and religious freedom, and the First Amendment protects our right to worship God as we choose. These Sunday laws not only violate our Constitution, but are a foretaste of what is to come according to Bible prophecy. When church and state unite to enforce Sunday worship, this will be an image to the beast and that it will be an image or reflection of the way the papacy, the beast, has used political power and violence to enforce their doctrines in the past. There will be a death decree against God's people who refuse to accept this mark of the beast, the false day of worship. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Even as we speak, the movement to keep Sunday holy is gaining prominence around the globe. In his latest encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, the Pope engages the world in a discussion on how we are treating our planet and what we can do to improve. Interestingly, the Pope uses this encyclical to promote a day of worship, not the Bible Sabbath, but the first day of the week, Sunday. The Pope states that Sunday is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Students of the Bible will see this as one more step in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Climate change, moral decline, or a financial collapse could all be used as an excuse to enforce Sunday worship. What's more, the leaders of Protestant churches, which were once strongly opposed to the false doctrines of the Catholic Church, are now extending their hands to unite with Rome. Consider the words of Bishop Tony Palmer, who is here speaking to a large crowd of evangelical, supposedly Protestant Christians. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? The protest is over. 
The protest is over. The Pope also expressed his desire for unity via phone conference at the same event. Evangelical leader Kenneth Copeland, who invited Palmer to the event, goes on to agree with the Pope's quest for unity between Catholics and Protestants. And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in, in his, his, his heart for the unity of the body of Christ. We come together in the unity of our faith, hallelujah. This ecumenical movement is simply a fulfillment of prophecy, which speaks of the world following after this antichrist beast power, the papacy, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. The Catholic Church-State Union, one of the most influential powers in the world, is at the center of this ecumenical movement, which will create a one-world religion in the last days. In order for the world churches to unite, there must be a compromise in doctrine, and Sunday worship, the mark of the papacy's authority, will be a foundational unifying factor. Unity is a good thing, but never at the expense of truth. For more information on how this Mark of the Beast will be enforced, make sure you are subscribed to this channel with bell notifications turned on. And look out for the video, The USA in Bible Prophecy. I realize that this Bible teaching may be new to some of you. I know it was for me as well. But friends, I appeal to you today, go by the Bible. Remember, if it's in the Bible, I want it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me. Some of you may be thinking, but my pastor does not teach this, or he says that keeping the Sabbath is not important. What does the Bible say about these kind of pastors or teachers? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Friends, the Bible condemns pastors who are willfully ignorant about God's law. Many church leaders will encourage their members to keep nine out of ten commandments, saying the Sabbath is no longer binding. But the Bible says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. How does God feel about pastors who make no difference between common things and holy things such as the Sabbath? Her priest have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Almost all Protestant churches have openly admitted there is no biblical support for keeping Sunday holy, but they still support it and neglect to teach the true Bible Sabbath. How should we respond? We ought to obey God rather than men. While we cannot judge the hearts of church leaders, we must put God first and follow the light that He has revealed to us. When we know the truth, we are responsible to obey it. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. In fact, the Catholic Church gives this startling challenge to Protestant churches for which they have no biblical answer. You will tell me that Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, but that the Christian Sabbath has been changed to Sunday. Changed? But by whom? Who has authority to change an express commandment of Almighty God? When God has spoken and said, Thou shalt keep holy the seventh day, who shall dare to say, Nay, thou mayest work and do all manner of worldly business on the seventh day, but thou shalt keep holy the first day in its stead? This is a most important question, which I know not how you can answer. You are a Protestant, and you profess to go by the Bible and the Bible only. And yet in so important a matter as the observance of one day in seven as a holy day, you go against the plain letter of the Bible and put another day in the place of that day which the Bible has commanded. The command to keep holy the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. You believe that the other nine are still binding. 
Who gave you authority to tamper with the fourth? If you are consistent with your own principles, if you really follow the Bible and the Bible only, you ought to be able to produce some portion of the New Testament in which this fourth commandment is expressly altered. Friends, an attack, a breach, has been made on God's law. His holy day, the Sabbath, is being trampled on by the majority of the Christian world. The truth is not always popular, but just like in the days of Noah, and like Daniel in Babylon, and like the few disciples who followed Christ, God has His true followers who will obey the truth that He reveals to them, even if it is new or different. God is looking for people who will stand for Him in these last days. The Bible describes this faithful group. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this great promise is given specifically to those who keep the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor Him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord hath spoken." What a promise! I hope you will join me, friend, in honoring God's true Sabbath day and receiving the peace and special blessing that comes with it. In the final days of Earth's history, when the death decree is made on God's people who refuse to accept a false day of worship, a loud voice will echo through the skies, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Yes, those who keep the true Sabbath day, the seal of God, will be protected in the last days. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Babylon's fiery furnace, God will use this great trial to test and refine their character, preparing them for heaven. And like He did for those faithful Hebrews, He'll be right by our side through the great trial and will deliver us. But those who receive this dreaded mark will suffer the indescribable pain of missing out on eternal life. Dear friend, you can avoid this infinite loss. I believe God has brought you to this video for a reason, so that you can know the truth. We are now faced with a choice. Will we obey man or will we obey God? Will you follow the crowd or will you follow the truth? The Mark of the Beast issue is all about worship and worship is directly related to obedience. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Who will have the authority in our lives, ourselves, man, or God? Friend, Jesus is appealing to you today. If you love me, keep my commandments. Will you accept his invitation? If you love Jesus enough to keep his commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath, please write in the comment section below, Lord, I choose the seal of God and reject the mark of the beast. Praise God for your decision, friend. Continue to pray for the strength to maintain your decision and He will provide it. If this video has been helpful and you would like others to know these powerful truths, please make sure to like, comment, and share this video. For more information on the Mark of the Beast and other critical end time topics, I highly recommend this life-changing book, The Great Controversy. To order yours today, simply click on the link above or in the description below. This video is part of a playlist called Hope Through Prophecy. I encourage you to watch this full playlist in order by clicking the link below. And make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, with all bell notifications turned on. But most importantly, friends, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.